Alright you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. Alright, I hope everybody had a great holiday, and we're going to finish things out at the end of the year here talking about our reversible causes of cardiac arrest, what we commonly refer to as the H's and T's. So looking at and evaluating these when your patient is coding is going to be something that's going to be absolutely vital to the success and outcome of the code. And I can remember being new and trying to think through what these H's and T's were, which of course in that high stress situation is really not going to go too well. So hopefully with this lesson here that you guys will have a better understanding of these and be able to recall them quickly when you find yourself in one of these situations. But if this is your first time to this channel and watching one of our videos, then I really hope that by the end of this video that we'll have earned a subscription from you. We consistently put out critical care educational content such as this video here, and I really hope that you find some value from this and hopefully any future lessons that we put out. Make sure when you do subscribe though, you hit that bell icon and select all notifications. That way whenever we put out a new video that you guys will be notified immediately. As always, a special shout out to all of our awesome subscribers out there who continue to come back and watch our videos and support our channel. You guys do not go unnoticed and I really appreciate you. And also don't forget to check us out on some of the other social media such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson and this is ICU Advantage. Alright, so let's go ahead and get into our lesson here talking about these reversible causes of cardiac arrest. All right, so to start off, let's imagine that we are at work, we're taking care of a pretty sick patient, and the unthinkable happens. So your patient is coding now. You've called a code, you've started compressions, everybody showed up to your room, and you've been following the ACS algorithm, but still you've got nothing back on this patient. So it's at this point that we want to start thinking about what our possible causes could be. Now some causes just are not reversible, and this unfortunately is not going to turn out well for your patient more than likely. But some causes are reversible though, and oftentimes if we fix the underlying problem, then we can get our patient back and really prevent this from happening again. And so because of this fact, we need to make sure that we search for and treat any possible contributing factors. And so that really leads us into talking about these reversible causes. And so we have 11 main reversible causes that you're really going to want to dedicate the time and energy into memorizing these. Anytime your patient codes, you should be going through this list of these possible contributing factors and really seeing if any of them exist in your patient and whether or not they can and should be treated, really in order to try to get your patient back again. So to aid you in remembering these, they've been divided up into two groups what we call the H's and the T's. And so the H's are going to be a group of six causes that all begin with the letter H. And those six causes are hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ions, hypo or hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia, and hypothermia. And now for the T's, these are going to be things like toxins, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, thrombus, and trauma. So like I said, it's going to be really important that you guys memorize these here. When you're in that high stress code situation, you really want to have these burned into your memory. So these are the 11 reversible causes listed out here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these one by one and talk about each one a little bit more in depth in terms of what we're looking for and how we're possibly going to treat these. So the first one here that we're going to talk about is our hypovolemia. And so hypovolemia, this is where our patients have decreased volume in their vasculature, which essentially means we have decreased tissue perfusion. And so some of the causes that we want to consider when looking at hypovolemia are going to be things like poor intake or losses. And this is going to be from things like vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration, and even burns. We could also be looking at a relative hypovolemia with something like sepsis, or even something as simple as blood loss. Now some of the things that we could see in our patient, perhaps maybe not in the moment of the code, but perhaps just prior that can help us really determine that this might be one of the causes that we're looking at, would be things like if they had a rapid heart rate and hypotension just prior, do they have any obvious blood loss, or do they have an elevated temperature? 
all of things can be clues to give us an indication of what was going on. Now, when it comes to treating these patients, first and foremost, we want to quickly establish either IV or IO access. And so from there, we either need to give this patient fluid, or if this is a blood loss that's going on, then we need to replace it with blood products. All right, so next, let's go ahead and talk about hypoxia. And I think hypoxia is pretty self-explanatory. And really, the, the top cause for this is some sort of respiratory failure, although less commonly, we can see things like airway obstruction. Now, obviously, when we're talking about respiratory failure, this can cover a lot of different things. So you really got to kind of think about what's going on with your patient and whether this is some sort of failure within their ability to either ventilate or oxygenate themselves. For these patients, obviously, we're going to be looking at what our SpO2 is. We're going to get an ABG and use that to evaluate our, what our patient's gases are. Uh, you're also going to see cyanosis in these patients. And finally, to treat these patients, we need to give them oxygen, we need to ventilate them, and then possibly intubate. We essentially need to take over the patient's respiratory effort to ensure that they're getting the oxygen that they need. Make sure, though, after intubation that we're checking for equal chest rise, uh, as well as getting that end tidal CO2. And really at this point here, if the intubation and full vent support is not enough, and we've determined that this is some sort of reversible issue that's going on with this patient, then we could also look at some other modality like VV ECMO. All right, the next on our list here is going to be our hydrogen ions. And really, if we think about this, if we have an accumulation of hydrogen ions, this means we have acidosis. So kind of a tricky play on our H's and T's, but it makes it fit in nicely here. Now, when we're talking about acidosis in our patients and we're looking at these causes, there's really two main camps that we're looking at. The first one is going to be our respiratory failure. And this is essentially where we're going to see that accumulation of CO2 in these patients. Or we could be looking at some sort of metabolic acidosis. And this can be from a variety of different things, such as sepsis, some sort of ingestion or tox, or diabetic ketoacidosis or alcoholic ketoacidosis. And our primary assessment for these patients is going to be to get an ABG and assess whether this is a respiratory or a metabolic problem. Now, if this is a respiratory problem, we're going to need to ventilate these patients in order to blow that CO2 off. If this is a metabolic problem, then obviously we want to address whatever the cause of the metabolic acidosis is. But in these patients, we want to consider giving them bicarb in order to correct that acidosis. All right, continuing on, let's talk about our hypo or hyperkalemia. Now, when we're talking about hypokalemia, typically we're talking about anything less than 3.5, although we really start to see EKG changes when we're less than 2.7. And for hyperkalemia, here we're talking about patients who have a potassium that's greater than 5.5. Now, if we're dealing with a hypokalemia, some of the causes that we want to look at are going to be things like vomiting, diarrhea, or excessive use of diuretics. But in the case of hyperkalemia, we want to consider things like renal failure. Look and see, do they have a fistula or an HD line? This can be a really good indication, and you probably want to consider hyperkalemia here. Is this patient in DKA? The acidosis that they're experiencing in the ketoacidosis is going to shift that potassium out of the cells and into the vasculature as well as we're going to have the hyperglycemia that's going to be pulling water out as well, which is also going to cause that solvent drag, both of these contributing and adding to an elevation in our patient's potassium. We can also see things like trauma, burns, uh, if there's some sort of hemolysis that's going on, or even rhabdomyolysis. Now, some of the things that we want to assess for as possible indications of this, in the case of our hypokalemia, we could see things like either flat or inverted T waves, and then also possibly the presence of U waves. In the case of hyperkalemia, we're going to be looking for those peak T waves or wide QRSs. And then obviously, in order to really know what's going on with the patient with their potassium, we really have to get those stat labs. And this is where it's really good to have some sort of point of care lab testing like an ISTAT. That way you can get your results immediately and know what's going on. Now, in order to treat these patients, to treat the patient with hypokalemia, obviously we want to make sure and give them potassium replacement. We want to do this pretty quickly, but remember, not too quickly. In the case of hyperkalemia, 
there's a couple different things that we're going to do. First is we're going to give them calcium with the goal of protecting the cardiac muscle. Then we're going to give them the combination of insulin and D50 with the goal of driving that potassium back into the cells. And we can also follow things up with either albuterol treatment or Lasix and Kxalate. We also want to give them sodium bicarb here because if we bring that pH up, we're also going to cause a shift of potassium into cells. And then finally, this patient may need dialysis. All right, next here, let's go ahead and quickly talk about hypoglycemia. This one's pretty obvious. This is where our patient has an extremely low blood sugar. So one of the things that we should be doing all the time pretty quickly is getting that point of care glucose test. And then from there to treat these patients, we want to give them D50 quickly. All right, so finally, let's talk about the last H that we have, and this is going to be our hypothermia. So here we really consider hypothermia with a temperature less than 35, but once their temperature drops below 30, then we're really going to see an impact on their cardiac output. Typically, hypothermia is going to be the result of some sort of exposure event. And so because of this, this really isn't often going to be a cause that we're going to see in the ICU. Treatment for these patients is going to be either some sort of passive or active rewarming. And this is going to be things like blankets, bear hugger, or possibly warm fluids. All right, so that finishes up our H's. So let's start talking about our T's. And the first one of these is going to be our toxins. Now, obviously, there can be many different toxins that we could list out here. Um, but just so you know, some of the most common causes of toxins that can lead to cardiac arrest are going to be things like our calcium channel blockers, our beta blockers, digoxin, uh, our TCAs, and cocaine. Our assessment for these patients is going to involve looking for EKG changes such as QT prolongation, uh, looking at their pupils, and really looking at the history to try to figure out what's going on. And our treatment for these patients is going to really involve supportive care, and then if there's any sort of antidote available to give them that. All right, next is going to be our cardiac tamponade. And in cardiac tamponade here, we have fluid, usually blood, has built up around the heart in the pericardial sac that's preventing filling and, and ultimately decreasing our patient's cardiac output. Some of the causes that we want to consider for this are going to be patients who are either post-cardiac surgery or post-cath lab, aortic dissections, uh, some sort of trauma with penetrating wound. And we can also see malignancies and pericarditis, but this is really not common. Things to assess for these patients are going to be things like our Bex triad, which is going to be JVD, muffled heart tones, hypotension, and ultimately some sort of bedside ultrasound or echo is going to really be diagnostic for this. Treatment when we find our patients in this situation is very simple. We need to get the blood out. And we can do this through either a pericardiocentesis or a thoracotomy through a new opening or re-exploring a sternotomy they may already have. All right, the next T that we're going to talk about is something called tension pneumothorax. And in a tension pneumo, here we have air that has accumulated in the patient's pleural space, which if it builds up to the point of tension, that this can place pressure on the heart and the large vessels, which is ultimately going to decrease preload and ultimately lead to a decrease in cardiac output for our patient. Causes for this can, again, be something like trauma. It can be some sort of iatrogenic cause. So think about, did we just place a central line in this patient? Uh, as well as it can be related to a patient being on the vent and then some sort of barotrauma that leads to air getting in there. Now, when assessing these patients, we're going to be looking for things like JVD. Was there difficulty ventilating this patient? Do they have tracheal deviation, uh, uneven breath sounds, and if you can, or looking at a past x-ray may be beneficial as well. Once you discover this in your patient, the treatment's pretty simple, needle decompression, and then place a chest tube. All right, the next T that we're going to talk about is going to be our thrombus. And this one we actually break up into two parts here. One is going to be looking at our coronary thrombus, or what we refer to as an MI. And the other is going to be our pulmonary thrombus, or what we call PE. So in the case of our coronary thrombus, here we have some sort of blocked perfusion of cardiac muscle, and that's ultimately going to lead to hypoxic injury and cell death. 
Here, the patient might have been exhibiting substernal chest pain or those other classic AMI symptoms, uh, as well as we might also see ST changes on the EKG. So treatment for these patients is going to be get them to the cath lab ASAP if you have that available in order to revascularize them. If not, then we want to consider possible thrombolytics. And finally, a cabbage if necessary. Now, looking at our pulmonary thrombus, if they end up with a large PE, like a saddle PE, that this can really restrict the output of the right ventricle. These patients before could have been short of breath, uh, hypoxic, and tachycardic just prior to this. There's a few different treatment options that are available for these patients. First is going to be the possibility of an embolectomy. We also might consider using fibrinolytics. And ultimately, if you have the capability, you might also be considering something like VA ECMO. All right, and then finally, the last of these H and Ts, the last T that we're going to talk about here real quickly is going to be trauma. And this, there's really not much to say because in the ICU, this typically isn't going to be the primary cause of our patient's cardiac arrest. Uh, anything that could be a cause here is something that's going to be pretty obvious from primary and secondary surveys, typically down in the ED or trauma bay. So again, not something that we're really going to be considering in the ICU. All right, so that was all 11 of the H and Ts. Hopefully those make sense for you guys in terms of what they are, uh, what we're looking for, what some of those causes can be, uh, and how we're possibly going to treat this for our patient to reverse that cause of this cardiac arrest. Like I said, dedicate that time and energy in, into memorizing these so that you can just spit them out off the top of your head in the middle of a stressful situation. But one last way I have to kind of help you guys to remember these is if we really think about this in groups, what we're looking at and what sort of information we're looking to get. So just real quickly here, if you think, if you take a look at the monitor, what is it that you're looking at on the monitor that can be an indication for you? Here we want to be looking at our blood pressure. Is this hypovolemia? We want to be looking at our oxygen saturations. Is this hypoxia? And make sure you're taking a look at your temperature to see if this is hypothermia. Next, think about labs that we want to check. Again, we want to be checking an ABG to see if there's acidosis going on with these patients. We want to be checking for potassium, see if they're hypo or hyper. And then also we want to be checking a glucose to see if they're hypoglycemic. Next, if we think about our two main organ systems, our heart and our lungs. For our heart, we want to be considering things like are they having an MI with that thrombus, or is there some sort of tamponade? When looking at the lungs, this is where we're considering things like hypoxia or possibly tension pneumothorax. And then finally, if we just take a look at the whole body, here we're considering things like trauma and toxins. So hopefully that helps you guys out and gives you a different way of looking at this. Uh, to give you another way to be able to make sure that you guys remember what are those reversible causes. Because again, in that high pressure, high stress situation of your patient coding, the last thing you want to be thinking about is putting forth mental energy, trying to remember and recall these. All right, and so with that said, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope that you found this lesson useful. Uh, if you're new here, I hope that I earned a subscription from you. If you enjoyed the video, then leave us a like. Also, leave us a comment and let me know if you thought this information was useful to you. Make sure and check out another one of our awesome videos right here. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. You have a great day.